So for those of you who don't know, my husband David and I have four magnificent daughters who are now really young women, and it's such a joy to, to be with them and be inspired by them. This also happens to be my 11th year being a licensed minister in our movement. 11 years. Can you believe that? 11 years. <laughs> I was licensed here. Some of you will remember that. So, so about 15, 16 years ago-ish, I started having this overwhelming feeling that something, something was wanting to be born from within me. Something, something was calling me. So there was something that was wanting to, to, to come from within me out into the world. Something. And uh, at first, I thought, well, uh, it was like I knew it felt like something I was going to birth. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe we're supposed to have kid number five. You know, whether birth or adoption, we have both in our family. Um, you know, and it just kept coming, and, and I, then I thought, well, maybe it's a boy. We have four girls. Maybe I'm meant to have a boy in this lifetime. Um, and it just was around me, and it was powerful, and I was like, really? Wow, okay. You know, my husband David was like, <coughs> what? <coughs> what? <coughs> no, just kidding. Oh, uh, no. Um, thank God I got quiet. Thank God I listened. Because when I got quiet, I had been in this teaching long enough to know that anything big requires time in the dark, time within, time to, to allow that wisdom within us to come forth, to move from our head to our heart, the journey that we're all making on this spiritual path. And what over a period of time came to me was actually not that my next step and the thing that was calling me was to have another child. Rather, it was to become a minister. It was to really, really commit to the birth of that in my life. And I think about, I, I didn't have to listen. I could have taken that other path. It would have been fine and lovely and different. I would not be standing here. I guarantee you I'd have my hands full. <laughs> I wouldn't be in the place of spiritual growth that I am now. My job, my calling, that which I am here to bring into the world fills me, fills me and sustains me. And, you know, I'm so grateful that I listened to that because I spent the first half of my life not listening. I don't know about any of you, <laughs> but I spent the first half of my life just barreling through. I'd get an idea, something would happen. Instead of getting quiet and thinking about it and, and contemplating it and listening and making sure that it was the divinity within me that was suggesting this and all of those things, <laughs> I would be like, you know, if there were 10 rungs on the ladder, I'd be on number three. Again, my husband. <laughs> no. He's always so supportive. But that was my mode of operandi. And... I know for some of you, it may be the opposite. For some of you, you may get an idea and sort of inertia sets in. I promise you that's another talk that will be coming. But this also pertains to the societal expectations that we have to return that text right away, to send, send, send our emails right away, to give an answer, to respond. And that is the opposite of the spiritual path. The author Jody Picoult wrote, in the space between yes and no, there is a lifetime. It's the difference between the path you walk and the one you leave behind. In the space between yes and no, there is a lifetime. It's the difference between the path you walk and the one you leave behind. 
My talk today is called The Space in Between. And what I'm talking about today really is the spiritual practice of sacred listening, of really sacred listening and what that means. There is um, a whole body of incredible knowledge given to us from the ancients in many indigenous traditions that there is a decision that has to be made. The shaman, the elder, the medicine woman will wait, will go off alone and contemplate and listen to receive, to receive the wisdom that is inherent within them. In Japanese wisdom, one of the most ancient practices of this, and I taught this at the meditation retreat. I know some of you, this will be familiar to, to you. But in a nutshell, there's this incredible practice called the practice of ma. It's spelled M-A in our English uh, uh, alphabet. However, it's pronounced M-A-A-H, ma. And it is the understanding that in life, the pause and the space in between is where the wisdom comes and where the beauty is. If you think about Japanese architecture, for example, you know the sort of quintessential Zen simplified rooms that have maybe one table with a beautiful arrangement of flowers. And the arrangement of flowers will always have space in between. They won't be a, a clumped together bouquet because the idea is that the beauty is in between, is in the empty space. In conversation in the Japanese culture, if you're talking about something that has depth to it, you will find that unlike in the West, there are many pauses. Someone will say how they feel and the other person receives it and then responds. This is the practice of ma. And for us in our teaching in New Thought, we have an opportunity to lean into this ancient wisdom and for us, what it looks like is it looks like turning within. It looks like practicing the pause. It looks like slowing down and listening sacredly to that which is wanting to come forth. In my life, prior to finding this teaching, barreling through at 100 miles an hour, I guarantee you, I missed so many, so many opportunities to grow to learn, to be spiritually directed, because I was under the misconception that I had to do it all myself, and I had to do it at 100 miles an hour. Nothing could be further from the spiritual truth, nothing. The um, beautiful reading that Terry gave us earlier from Jaya John, the line in that that is so filled with gold or God for me, is the line where he said, impatience short circuits our intuition. Isn't that amazing? Impatience short circuits our intuition. Ernest Holmes called our intuition our God voice, or our, our voice of spirit within us that is always guiding us, that, that still small voice of wisdom that says, my darling, it's not baby number five, it's ministerial school. Hi, Shelly Walker. <laughs> so when we are racing, when we are impatient, we have cut off our direct connection to source. We have cut off our intuition, our, our built-in guidance system. So I'm going to invite you all this week, as you move through this week, notice the places in your life where you tend to be impatient. I invite you to get curious about those places where you get impatient, because what I can guarantee you is the places where you get impatient are the places where there is that gold or that God right underneath, just wanting to be expressed and wanting to make itself known. The places where you are impatient is an opportunity for growth for you. So rather than skimming over it and getting more impatient, I invite you to pull back and take a moment and breathe into the sacred place within yourself. You can always ask, just on the breath, anywhere, Spirit, what am I to know about this? Spirit, what am I to know about this? Why do I feel the urge and the need to rush? 
to pack it all in. What is this about God? What is this about love? To take this idea even further, I wanna share with you an experience that I had in France with my daughter Liv. Liv uh, is our oldest and I love mother-daughter trips wherever we go, it doesn't matter. I always learn from them. I always learn from them. So we're in this little tiny town in France. It's a 14th century town. I want you to picture cobblestones and tiny little roads that have huge, magnificent sort of homes and little shops with rounded edges and huge windows with, with balconies, wrought iron balconies that have flowers and ivy cascading all the way down to the ground. It was unbelievably beautiful, beautiful. We were there on a gorgeous day, the sun was shining. The center um, uh, area there of the town in front of this beautiful church that when I walked in, I just got tears. It was so stunning to me. There were classical musicians playing. I kid you not, you could smell the, the wafts of the croissants cooking from the boulangeries. I mean, it was just, the beauty was, like nothing I have ever seen. It was exquisite. And in this little tiny town, there was a train. It was like a little old-fashioned sort of locomotive, if you will, you know? But it was like a, it, was like a uh, it wasn't on tracks, and it was meant to drive through the town to give you a tour of this beautiful place. And so Liv and I thought, oh, what a great way to see this, this, this incredible town. This is great, we'll do this. And the way it was set up is there were individual cars kind of connected by a, by a thick chain and the conductor was in the front. There was a space there between the first car and the conductor and uh, just so sweet, so sweet. We get in, we get all buckled in and the chain is, is, you know, locks us in there and there we are and it's a 55 minute tour of this town. <clears throat> and as God would have it, spirit would have it, the moment the train started going, there was the highest pitch, most excruciatingly painful sound coming from the speakers above to the point where I can't, like I wouldn't do it for you in here, but kind of think of like a human dog whistle. I mean, it was gobsmackingly painful. And here we are in this train and we can't get out. I turn to Liv, she turns to me, and I'm like, we're both just like, what is happening? Here we are in this beauty and there is this sound, this painful sound. I turned around behind me and the people in the cars were just like, oh, one, one was like this and one was like this, very unhappy. However, when the train stopped, the sound stopped. So this painful sound would go as we're surrounded by this beauty. And as soon as it stopped, it was like you could kind of feel everyone just go. <sighs> so I realized about 10 minutes in, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is a teaching opportunity for me. Okay, God, I got it. I got it. And so what I began to do, and Liv kind of followed me because, you know, she was raised in this teaching is when we got to the stop, when the train would stop, I would get quiet and I would just turn within and I would go to that still, small voice within and I would allow it to speak to me and I would listen and I would get quiet and I would feel the calm in those brief moments and then the train would go and then it would stop and I would go and then the train would go and I would stop. And what I noticed is after a period of time, the sound of the train was not less painful. It was still just as excruciatingly high-pitched and annoying. But I was able to hold that discomfort and also recognize the beauty all around me. Both were happening simultaneously. And I recognized in that moment Ah, I got it, God, I got it, I got it. This is a metaphor for life. All of us, every one of us, we're on this train called life, and there is more beauty than we can comprehend. 
in the people around us, in the places, in our fur babies, in the trees, in the laughter, in the tears, in the music, everywhere is beauty. And at the same time, at the same time, there is pain. At the same time. And in our human evolution, our spiritual evolution, I like to call it, we are learning how to hold both how to hold both, it's part of our spiritual growth. And so, I know there may be some of you that are moving through personal pain, navigating loss of any kind, or a diagnosis, or divorce, or challenge, whatever it may be. And also, on the macrocosm, as a people, we are being asked to also recognize the pain of the whole. The pain that we collectively felt when we heard about the beloved 16-year-old black boy, Ralph Yurl, who was shot for going to the wrong house. The collective pain that we are feeling for the human rights being taken away from women, from trans people, we are being asked on this train of life to hold both. And this is what our teaching supports us through. This is what our teaching provides us the tools to navigate this, to be able to do this. I feel that we have an opportunity in this journey that we are all on, this holy, sacred path that we are all walking, to turn within even more, to listen sacredly even more so that we can navigate the pain in our lives and the pain in the world. And what is fascinating to me is that as we do this work collectively, we are then motivated to take action. Holocaust survivor, psychiatrist, an all-around brilliant human being. Author Viktor Frankl wrote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. Between stimulus and response, he writes, there is a space. I like to call it hang time. There's a space, and in that space is our power to choose our response, to let our response, our response lies our growth and freedom. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And so it begs to ask the question, how many times do we tune it out how numb have we become to the pain around us? It's an onslaught we receive all the time, yes? And so, as people of faith, as people on this journey, we are being asked to respond. We are being asked to get quiet, to, to lean into what is it exactly that is ours to do, you know? I had a beautiful, beautiful exchange with someone I love dearly. And one of the things that, that came to me that I have an opportunity to share here is that really we follow in this community, New Thought Center for Spiritual Living, we follow in the footsteps of the great movements, the clerical religious movements that moved the dial to support those in pain. If you think about it, you know, the, the Catholic worker movement, the Catholic worker movement so early on, radically, radically stood up and said, we want to support the unhoused and those that are food insecure. The incredible work of the farm workers union led by Cesar Chavez, it was pr predominantly a, a, a Protestant uh, um, movement to support farm workers' rights. 
all of the work that Jewish communities do in our country and around the world for free speech and protecting human dignity. The incredible work of Dr. King in the civil rights movement, all of the change, all of the responses, all of that were done, begun by people of faith who got quiet and who said, I am going to get off this train and I'm going to do something. The Quakers were abolitionists in this country. This is our call. Our call is to hold both the beauty and the pain and then to get quiet and listen to what is the direction, what is our next step, what is ours to do about it. Do you see? This is our work. And it's gonna be different for everyone. It's going to, to, to fall into different categories of places where you are specifically interested. Today, after service, I'm gonna be facilitating our spiritual activism meeting that we're gonna be having. I invite those of you who wanna stay, it's at 12.30. You can get some nosh and join us in the Learning Center. Just lean into the question, get curious. Where is it that you might be able to take a stand? Where is it that you might be able to support those in need? Uh, this morning, um, I love to read Ernest Holmes 365 every morning. Does anybody, people have that? I love it. I love it, love it, love it. And this very morning, he wrote, Deep within me is the answer to any question I might have. I let divine wisdom be my guide as I turn from negativity and fear. My rightful place is shown to me. In back of me is the potential of the universe. I declare new horizons will open, new ideas will flow, and a better world of joy and peace will be revealed. a better world of joy and peace will be revealed. We have an opportunity, my friends, to listen sacredly, to turn within, to listen to what our own personal next steps are in our own life, and also, also just as important to get quiet so that we can receive guidance in how we can participate in the healing and the revealing of the wholeness of this one human family that we get to be a part of. So I invite you to take a moment here, if you're willing. I invite you to close your eyes for just a moment. Turn within. If you're more comfortable, you can gaze downward if that's better for you. And those of you online, just take a breath right here. Starting with our own life, our own experience, I invite you to ask spirit within silently, what is mine to know? What is mine to know? And it'll be about any area in your life, maybe something that's causing you challenge or difficulty or you have question around. Spirit, what is mine to know about this? And let it bubble up. Give yourself permission to receive. What am I to know here about this thing, whatever it is? What am I to know? What am I to know here? Taking in another deep breath, the next question. I invite you to silently ask yourself, what is calling me forth? What is it within me that is being called Fourth, it doesn't have to be big or small. 
But life, no matter what stage you're in, is never meant to be stagnant. It is always about growth. It is always, always about discovery. And in this moment, get curious. What is it within me that is calling me forward? Where is my next becoming? And the next question I invite you to silently ask yourself is with great gentleness and love. Where am I impatient in my life? Lean into that. What is there for me? Where can I activate more patience and therefore more peace in my life? Affirming, as Ernest Holmes said, that the answer is deep within us to every question we have. I invite you to take a deep breath and open your eyes when you're ready. I invite you to engage in these questions throughout the week. Let's put our teaching to practice together. Are you willing? Yes, good. Because I'm going to continue some of this next week in my talk next week. So I invite you to play with this, get curious about this, see what you discover see where you can get off the train. Hi friends, thank you so much for watching and I hope that this message supported you. We are a nonprofit and we do all of this based solely on the gifts that you give. No amount is too small or too large. You can text to give, you can go online and check out our website. We're doing so much. You can give that way. Thank you so much for being here, for being a part of this community and for supporting this message of bringing more light, more love and spirit-led social action out into the world. Thank you. You're loved. So loved.